Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Kate Quinn, and I am the Deputy Bureau Chief within Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz's Domestic Violence Bureau. I've spent more than the last decade fighting for justice on behalf of survivors of domestic violence. And I am so thrilled to welcome you to the Queens DA's second annual Domestic Violence Awareness and Resources webinar. District Attorney Katz started this webinar last year to get the word out to the Queens community about the work that we do here in the Domestic Violence Bureau of the Queens DA's office, along with our partners here at the Family Justice Center. I'd like to open the webinar with the message that DA Katz has delivered to survivors of domestic violence on so many occasions. When she promised to work collaboratively to keep them safe, the message she delivered to survivors in the early days of the pandemic when she created a 24 hour domestic violence helpline, guaranteeing them access to an assistant district attorney or an advocate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that no one would ever have to feel alone and unsafe in their home. And the message that we deliver to survivors every single day here at the Family Justice Center. You are not alone. We are here to help. And no one deserves to suffer in silence. That is the message that I hope you take from this webinar. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken Applebaum, our acting bureau chief, who has dedicated his 37 year career to prosecuting and supervising the prosecution of domestic violence cases, felony <laughs> sex crimes, child abuse cases, homicide cases and crimes against the elderly. In addition to training new prosecutors in Queens, he has used his wealth of experience to conduct trainings with police and prosecutors in various jurisdictions. We are grateful that DA Katz has given us Ken and to Ken for his leadership. Ken, if you could please introduce our district attorney, the woman who has brought us all here together today, the district attorney of Queens County, Melinda Katz. Good morning, everyone. Let me tell you a little bit about our district attorney. District attorney Katz was elected in November of 2019, and then in January of 2020, became the first woman ever to serve as Queens County district attorney. Born and raised in Queens, the ACATS is a product of the, our public school system, and she's been a public servant for almost 30 years. Previously, she was elected to serve in the New York State Assembly, and she wrote and passed critical legislation to protect New York's most vulnerable citizens. She also served on the New York City Council and as Queensboro, uh, Queensboro president, where she worked tirelessly on many of the issues we'll be discussing today. In confronting the unique challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, District Attorney Katz dedicated herself to ensuring the safety of the two and a half million plus people who live, work, and visit uh, our borough uh, at every year while implementing meaningful changes in the criminal justice system. At the same time, she has launched initiatives aggressively uh, pursuing and prosecuting domestic violence abusers which includes assembling the team of experienced and talented domestic violence prosecutors who will be speaking to you this morning. Please welcome Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, just to jump on what uh, Chief Applebaum said, it is interesting to me that in the very first few days that I was a district attorney of the County of Queens, uh, we were prosecuting cases uh, and we're in the midst of prosecuting cases of laws that I wrote and drafted when I was an assembly member 30 years ago. A uh, course of sexual conduct for kids. Um, I was a prime sponsor of the uh, Domestic Violence and Intervention Act all the way in 1994. Uh, and so to be here in this position, be able to prosecute under the laws that I helped draft uh, has really been an amazing turning point in my career. I wanna thank Chief Applebaum for all the work that he has done um, not only today, but really for the people of Queens County and those that believe they have nowhere to turn. And he does it every day. A uh, special thank you uh, to those that helped organize today, uh, Deputy Chief um, Mary Kate Quinn and our Community Partnerships Division under the leadership of ADA Colleen Babb, and of course, Jackie Rosado, 
Uh, I do want to thank um, Deputy Chief Nicolata Caferi uh, uh, for the work she does in animal abuse. As many of you know, uh, animal abuse is often part of domestic violence and the threat to the animals is part of how the control happens in the household. So we want to thank her for the work that she does in partnership with our Domestic Violence Bureau uh, and all the groups that are here today. <clears throat> we have representatives from Safe Horizon, from New Destiny Housing, from the Family Justice Center, uh, and they all provide crucial services. And I, and I thank them for their work. We can't do it alone. We can't prosecute only when it comes to domestic violence. We need to have wraparound services and all of these organizations that you're gonna hear from today and that we work with every single day are part of that wraparound services to not only prosecute those that abuse others, but also to give those abused uh, individuals better lives and hope. And that's a huge part of what we all do together. Um, this month marks the National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and it gives us the opportunity to connect with individuals and organizations offering that support while raising the awareness of this important issue. Um, as uh, Deputy Chief Quinn said, no one deserves to suffer the trauma of intimate partner violence alone. And my office makes every effort to provide those meaningful services with all of the service providers that you have here today. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, you know, we saw a huge increase in domestic violence. And that's why as soon as the city and state started to lock down, uh, I created the Domestic Violence Helpline. The interesting thing about this hotline is that you can call it and ask for either services or an ADA. So even if an individual is at home, worried, not knowing what to do, where to turn to, where to go, they're not uh, ready to start criminal action. They can call that hotline and get transferred to service providers. And the reason we did that was because during the pandemic, it was so hard to reach those that were abused. There was quarantine, there was people in their homes. You didn't have the excuse anymore of going out. Your abuser wasn't working either, he was home. Uh, and so it was important to me that we were available whenever someone who was abused need us, needed us to be available. And that was 24 hours. So we continued it after the pandemic and we'll continue that uh, indefinitely. Um, but it was important that people were able to reach us. Um, there are a variety of resources available to help our survivors reclaim their lives. That's why I'm glad to be joining all of the panelists today. Uh, you will first hear from legal experts from my Domestic Violence Bureau. The Bureau is dedicated to the investigation and the prosecution of intimate partner violence. This includes harassment, assault, violations of orders of protection, as well as cases involving strangulation, stalking, attempted murder even. The Bureau works closely with the Queens Family Justice Center, works to ensure that victims are connected to safety planning and to counseling services, Later on in the program, you'll hear from a number of our partners based out of the Queens Family Justice Center and organizations that we work with. I would like to thank Lenny uh, Smith from New Destiny Housing, Zalika Gomez from Safe Horizon, Susan Jacob, of course, from Family Justice, uh, and uh, Solange uh, Raffo uh, from the Family Justice Center. I wanna thank all of you for being here at this important uh, webinar today. My office is, is grateful and we're proud to call you all partners in our collective fight against domestic violence in Queens County. Unfortunately, it remains severely underreported and I'm committed to eliminating the stigma in many cultures and many communities that is attached to being a survivor. Combating domestic violence takes all of us. I encourage everyone on this webinar to take full advantage of our, resource, of our resources in order to break that silence that seems to surround DV so often. So I thank all of you for being here today. Please reach out to any of us, including those organizations that are here represented so well, if one ever needs help, either in your organization or others that you know. ADA Quinn, I turn it back to you. Thank you, DA Katz. I am so grateful to you for all of the work you've done uh, with domestic violence. And in particular today, for creating this space and giving us the opportunity to introduce the Queens community to some of the people who are fighting for survivors of domestic violence here in Queens County. Thank you. Now, during this webinar, you will have a chance to meet some of the ADAs in the Domestic Violence Bureau. 
And that will help you to understand what happens if you or someone you love reports that they have been abused by an intimate partner. We will also introduce you to some of our community partners in the fight against domestic violence. Because as DA Katz said, we know we cannot fight this battle alone. And so we rely so heavily on our partnerships to keep survivors of domestic violence safe. And we want you, the community, to be confident in knowing that if you or someone you love reports that they have been abused by an intimate partner, the case will be handled by an ADA trained to truly understand the dynamics of power and control, the cycle of abuse, someone who understands the trauma associated with DV, the pressures you may face from family, friends, or community, someone who will take the time to get to the root of the problem and to provide support to keep you safe, and to ensure that you, the Queens community, leave this webinar with faith in us I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to some members of our team. And I'm going to start with one of our newer members, ADA Joseph Shinablo, a graduate of Hofstra Law School and Marine veteran who joined our office after a career as a domestic violence prevention officer with the NYPD. Joe is passionate about fighting for survivors of domestic violence. And the survivors who engage with him, who work with him, feel his empathy and passion for his work right away. So Joe, I'd like you to take a few moments to tell us about your path to the office and why you feel so strongly about the work we do here in the Domestic Violence Bureau. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Quinn, and thank you all. I'm honestly humbled and honored to be part of such an awesome team. Um, as Ms. Quinn said, I am a former United States Marine Corps combat veteran. I served uh, for approximately eight years uh, I've done three deployments overseas, two during peacetime, uh, one during the Iraq war. Um, I knew then during my time of service that I wanted to continue that public service to my local community. I was born in Queens. Um, that's where I came back to after my service. Uh, immediately after returning from Iraq in 2003, I found myself in January of 04 in the New York City Police Academy. Um, where I started training to become a New York City police officer. Uh, upon graduating, I was assigned to the 103 precinct as a, a police officer, uh, then was transferred to the 105 precinct where I actually became a domestic violence police officer. Um, you know, some of the things I did as a domestic violence police officer was uh, to follow up with open reports that the police had from previous tours or previous days um, and formulate a high propensity list. We would identify uh, victims who may be in the most need or may be in need of services that they, they might not be aware of. Um, so we would collaborate and contact these victims and put them in contact with some of the people that you see here today on your screen. Um, also as a domestic violence police officer, we would respond to the domestic violence radio runs uh, and we would help facilitate uh, the proper documentation and reporting of domestic violence incidents uh, for the officers on the scene. Um, unfortunately, uh, due to a routine home visit that I had from my high propensity list, uh, I did have a home visit where I showed up with and, and uh, it did result uh, in me having to retire from the job. So three surgeries later, uh, due to a domestic violence incident gone wrong, um, I found myself still with this passion and desire to serve. Uh, so I, I quickly volunteered to um, help mentor veterans. So I was part of this mentorship program uh, through Columbia University called Battle Buddies. Um, one of the unique strengths that I brought to that team were, we all know in, in domestic violence is big within the veteran community. So I was tapped into to help kind of facilitate whatever needs these returning veterans would have um, and the struggles that they would endure, I knew firsthand because returning and assimilating back to life here uh, in the community of Queens is, is not easy at times. Um, after that, I, I decided, look, got to finish my degree. I went to St. John's University, finished my undergrad. Um, and I knew, I knew I wanted to get back into working with victims of domestic violence, survivors of domestic violence. So I said, you know, what better way than to become an assistant district attorney at the Domestic Violence Bureau, and I made that my goal. Uh, so after graduating law school, 
um, I, I applied and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to now serve the community um, in once uh, in which I once served now in a different capacity, understanding it from a much better view of the, the importance of, of helping survivors of domestic violence. Thank you, Joe. Um, I think without a doubt, that perspective that you bring, that deep personal understanding of the dangers of domestic violence combined with your desire to understand root causes is part of what has made you such a great domestic violence prosecutor. And I'd also like to introduce one of our most senior uh, line assistants in the Bureau, Senior Assistant District Attorney, Nicole Reed. A Queens native and graduate of Georgetown Law, Nicole is one of the most talented and accomplished ADAs in the Bureau. She handles some of the most complex and violent domestic violence cases. I've worked with Nicole for more than a decade, and I know that she is honest, fair, and always able to gain the trust of her survivors. Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you've dedicated your career to fighting for DV survivors here in Queens? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mary Kate, for that great introduction. Um, so I just wanted to start off by telling you one of the models of which with guides my life, essentially, and that is for to whomsoever much is given, much is required. Um, and I, as Mary Kate stated, I am born and raised in Southeast Queens, New York. Um, I was raised by a single mother who was also an immigrant um, from the island of Jamaica. And so I'm first generation here in America. And um, as I stated, I grew up in Southeast Queens. I'm a product of the public school system uh, where I graduated from high school right here in Queens. I went to Townsend Harris High School, uh, then went on to college in Connecticut. I went to Wesleyan University. There, I became a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, of which I'm still active in the Queens alumni chapter um, here in this borough. Uh, as I'm, when I graduated from college, I came back home and I worked actually for a few years at a law firm here in Manhattan before going to law school. I then graduated from Georgetown University Law Center. And while I was at Georgetown, I interned right here in Queens. I always knew I wanted to come back home to practice law. And I was fortunate to get an opportunity to intern here at the Queens District Attorney's Office in the Domestic Violence Bureau. Um, there is where I develops my love uh, for this office and for uh, prosecuting domestic violence cases. And so upon graduating, I returned and was fortunate to be hired here by the office and I actually started off as a domestic violence prosecutor right here in the bureau. Um, I had the opportunity to go throughout different bureaus in our office during my time here and returned to the Domestic Violence Bureau as a felony ADA uh, back in 2017. Um, I have enjoyed my time working as a DB prosecutor. As Mary Kay stated, I have prosecuted various uh, felonies, serious felonies over my years here. Um, and I also am proud um, to be a representation um, in this office. I believe in the power and benefits of representation. And I believe that's part of the reason um, and my background of why I can connect with victims so well and survivors of domestic violence and enable them to relate to them on some different level um, sometimes and help them to put their trust in me, which obviously helps prosecute the case. Um, I also try to be uh, a source of support and outreach to those the younger ADAs here in our, our bureau. And I've always had a servant's heart. So I actually continue to outreach and do things in my community um, with my sorority. I actually am a mentor for high school girls with the program that we call GEMS, the Dr. Dino Noble GEMS Institute, which stands for growing and empowering myself successfully. And there I mentor high school girls and we talk about 
uh, relationships, particularly how to develop healthy relationships, how to uh, identify red flags and toxic relationships. And that's to enable the, these young women um, who come from, you know, different backgrounds, some disadvantage um, in terms of helping them to try to avoid ending up in domestic violence situations or to know the different support and areas that they can tell their friends or family members if they encounter such a situation. So I'm just happy to be uh, a part of this presentation and this webinar today. I know that those who are joined will learn a plethora of information from all the decades and years of experience that you have here from both the law prosecutorial side and as well as our social services side. So I hope that you continue to gain knowledge from um, this webinar. And again, I am happy to serve here at the Queens District Attorney's Office with the Servant's Heart. Thank you, Nicole. I am proud to have Nicole and Joe representing our Bureau and our office. And I wanna just tell you a little bit more about our Bureau because those are just two of the 25 ADAs and 12 support staffers who we have here on site all of whom made the choice to dedicate their work to domestic violence cases. So I can guarantee you that whoever is assigned to yours or your loved one's case, they will be met with empathy and someone with a true desire to help and a passion for these cases. And Nicole spoke about the value of representation. DA Katz has created a team of ADAs from diverse backgrounds and experiences. From those of us born and raised in Queens County to those born out of state to those who've immigrated here from other countries, we bring a variety of experiences and perspectives to the work that we do. Our staff speaks a number of languages from Spanish to Mandarin to Punjabi to Bangla to Urdu, just to name a few. We want to be as accessible as possible to the people of Queens County, the most diverse borough in the world. We also know that part of being accessible is our location. Part of being accessible is our partnerships at the Family Justice Center. So we wanna tell you a little bit about the center. The Domestic Violence Bureau is located in the Queens Family Justice Center at 12602 82nd Avenue. Run by the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, the Family Justice Center is a true one-stop shop for victims of domestic violence where survivors can come to speak to an ADA, a police officer, a civil attorney, seek counseling or safety planning all in the same place. All with people who know that the best results are achieved when we collaborate to keep survivors safe. So to highlight that collaboration for you, I want to introduce you to some of our partners. And I have to start with Susan Jacob the executive director of the New York City Family Justice Center here in Queens County. Susan is the one who brings us all together and keeps everything running smoothly, who answers all of our calls whenever we are concerned about someone's safety, someone who changes lives every day with her take action approach. Susan has been working at the Family Justice Center in various administrative capacities since 2008 and is currently executive director. Prior to her position with the mayor's office, she worked in the HIV AIDS field for over 10 years, both in New York City and India. Susan, I know firsthand how dedicated you are to creating a diverse, collaborative-based center that can address the varied needs of domestic violence survivors and queens. Could you please explain to us what the Family Justice Center is and your vision for the Queens Family Justice Center? Thank you so much, Mary Kay. Thank you, Queens DA Katz, for hosting this very important event on a very important topic. Thank you so much, Kenny, Audra, Mary Kay, Howard, Nicole, and Joseph, as we are so appreciative of this strong partnership. And it is a true honor to be here with my fellow colleagues, Sol, Zuleika, and Lainey, who you'll be hearing from shortly. Thank you to everyone who is here and I'm so grateful to be on this virtual space because we all care so deeply for survivors. Just by being in this space, we together can make a difference. Um, this month is so special because it is honoring survivors, their strength and resiliency. Special thank you, DA Katz, 
for this incredible partnership. And we are honored to be working alongside with you. Special thank you, of course, to Mary Kate Quinn, our amazing moderator. She is truly remarkable. We would not be able to do this work with, without you. You are outstanding. And I'm truly grateful to be working alongside with you as well. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. Um, so what we do is there is a family justice center in every single borough and survivors of domestic violence can get connected to free and confidential assistance. Survivors can call the FJC for remote services at 718-575-4545 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but we are also opened, um, so anyone can walk into the Family Justice Center from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. as well to utilize any of our various services, which my colleague will be talking about shortly. The Mayor's Office and Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, we, we develop policies and program, provide training, prevention education, conducts research evaluation, we perform community outreach and operates the New York City Family Justice Center. We collaborate with various different city agencies and community stakeholders, which you will be hearing from shortly to ensure access to inclusive services for domestic and gender-based violence survivors. And GBV, gender-based violence can include intimate partner violence, family violence, elder abuse, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. Uh, the New York City Family Justice Centers are multidisciplinary service centers where we have ser social services, civil, legal, criminal justice assistance for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence and their children. We have an incredible children's, uh, children's program here. Um, we, we know that many times when um, clients come in, they have their children with them. So we, uh, any of our kids can utilize our children's room and pretty soon you'll be hearing about our, our book program, which Sol will be talking about a little bit further. Um, and all are welcome regardless of language, income, gender identity, or immigration status. And interpret interpretation services are also available at the FJC. Uh, staff on site, I believe, speak over 23 languages. And we also have uh, phone interpretation. Uh, our Family Justice Center can support people with immediate crisis needs, um, as well as folks who are no longer experiencing abuse, but still healing and dealing with long-term effects. Um, so, and also I just wanna clearly state that if anyone is an undocumented immigrant who is a survivor of a crime, they are protected by New York City's confidential aid program. So no one should be afraid to come forward uh, to receive any of these supportive services at the Queens Family Justice Center. And now I am so thrilled to be introducing Solangeli Raffo, who is our amazing client services coordinator. She works tirelessly for survivors at the QFJC, and I'm so honored to be introducing Sol. And Sol will be speaking about how the Family Justice Center can help in terms of the services that are offered here on site. Sol? Hi, everyone. Good morning. I am honored to share this space with all of you today. The Queens Family Justice Centers um, can help you with planning for your safety, applying for public benefits, shelter, housing, and other support services. Information on job training programs, including help with resume building, writing, and interviewing skills. We also provide and help with referrals to education programs, including workshops to help with budgeting, credit repair, and English as a second language, known as ESL classes. And all of this is possible through our holistic computer time program. We also um, have on-site mental health and counseling services to support emotional well-being for you and your children. We have legal help for orders of protection, custody, visitation, child support, divorce, housing, and immigration. We also have connection to train law enforcement, such as NYPD, the New York City um, Sheriff's Office, and the District Attorney's Office. Um, services are provided by several community-based organizations and city agencies that have cultural competency and expertise. The 
Queens Family Justice Center works with several on-site and off-site partners. I'm gonna name a few. Um, we have Arab American Family Support Center, Barrier Free Living, Garden of Hope, Greenwich House, which offers comprehensive mental health support for our survivors. We also have Korean American Family Service Center, Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty, Mount Sinai Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program, NOAA Savvy, Restore New York City, Safe Horizon, Saki for South Asian Women, the Urban Resource Institute, Violence Intervention Program, known as VIP, and the Women's Prison Association, to name a few. We practice um, a client-centered, so while we're co-located with the district attorney's office in each borough, and have domestic violence police officers on site, no one is required to engage with law enforcement. Though the help is here for everyone who wants to uh, report domestic violence, we support all survivors regardless. Even if they don't have a criminal case, they do not need to be involved in the criminal justice system to receive assistance. The Queens Family Justice Center ensures that immigrant survivors are connected to culturally competent and trauma-informed programs. The QFJC also offers a variety of other services. We prepare food every month and prepare these bags for clients that need them. We have a T-Mobile phone program, which are new smartphones for clients who are in need. We have Metro cards, and we have also clothing for children and kids of all sizes. And we also have snacks on site. <laughs> I'm going to pass it back to Susan. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you so much, Sol. We really, really appreciate that. Um, and we also just want to say, before I pass it on to Mary Kate, I wanna let all survivors know if they face domestic and gender-based violence, that we are here to support you. And also there is hope, which I've learned from many, many of the survivors who have the true honor of meeting every day. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for having us. Thank you, Susan and Sol. Um, Susan, you know, you ended by saying there is hope. And I was thinking that you and Soul and your team, you were the ones that give so many survivors hope. You give them a chance at a new life and the tools to leave abusive relationships and start over with their family. So every day here, we are amazed by the work that you do and the hope that you're able to give. And that brings me to our next speaker, Supervising ADA, Howard McCallum. Howard McCallum is a graduate of Howard University School of Law, and he's been an assistant district attorney in Queens County for over 18 years, working in the Criminal Court Bureau, Felony Trials Bureaus, Appeals, and now the Domestic Violence Bureau, where he supervises misdemeanor and felony prosecutions. And for the last several years, I've had the privilege of having the office right next to Howard. So I can tell you that there is no better person to discuss the collaboration between our office and the Family Justice Center partner agencies than Howard. He works so closely with our partners in finding ways to give survivors that hope. So Howard, I'll turn it over to you to describe for us your experience collaborating with the Family Justice Center partner agencies. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Mary Kay, for that introduction. When you come into the Queens Family Justice Center, um, there are stripes along the walls for each side of the Family Justice Center. Those stripes are different colors and they indicate that you're on the law enforcement side or you're on the mayor's side or you're on the social work side. So it is important that we have all of those people together in one building because if you need help with your case and you go to one particular place and then you have to go somewhere else to see NYPD and you have to go somewhere else for services that will be very time consuming and cumbersome to the survivors. So we have it all in one particular place. And it helps because we each have individual specialties, individual talents. If somebody needs help with housing, they can go to Safe Horizon, whereas we can't help them with housing. If they need shelter placement, they can go to the mayor's office who can help them with shelter placement because we don't have that ability. 
if they're if they're speaking to somebody at say Horizons or a counselor, and they have and they waive the confidentiality, they can come to us and ask us what's going on with their case. The counselors can come to us and tell us the concerns the clients have about the prosecution. If the, if the survivors are being harassed by the family of the offender, if there is a new, a new complaint they want to lodge, there's NYPD on site so they can speak to NYPD about lodging that complaint. The DA's office can go to court and speak to the judge and tell the judge that the survivor is being harassed by the family of the defendant and we can help them in that particular way. So it's very important that we have all of these people on site and that we work together to help the survivors. I've been in domestic violence for a long time now, and I've had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure of working with Safe Horizon, of working with Susan, of working with Queens Legal Services, of working with Savvy, of working with all the partners that we have here. And I can say firsthand that they are very dedicated to the helping of survivors and making sure that they go on with their life and that they feel that they are not alone. I had a case where there was an immigrant from Ecuador. Her and her partner were here and her children were still with the mother of the, the father in Ecuador, the mother of the defendant, the future defendant. They got into an argument and she was injured so much she needed hospitalization. The defendant was arrested and she didn't feel safe having the mother of the defendant be the person in Ecuador to take care of her children. So she returned to Ecuador to take care of her children. We work with Safe Horizon. We work with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We work with the Queens DA's office and NYPD. All of us work together to bring her back from Ecuador, to have her testify, to have her children come up to be with her after she was here so we could achieve all our goals. Her family could be together. She could feel safe. We could prosecute the case. We all work together for that common purpose. There was a caseworker at Safe Horizon. Her name was, An was Anidia. She had been here for 30 years and she was getting, to, getting ready to retire. She put off her retirement because she wanted to make sure that this client came back from Ecuador. This client got all the services she need. And when the client came in and she realized the client was in good hands, then she decided to retire. That's the kind of dedication that we have in the Family Justice Center. I had another case where a husband and wife were going through some tough times. And unfortunately, the husband shot the wife in the stomach in front of her child and her sister. We prosecuted that case. We were able to achieve a good result where the defendant was convicted based on the testimony of the, of the complainant. After that, Queens Legal Services filed for divorce for her, helped her serve the defendant in jail and achieve her divorce so she wouldn't have to continue to be married to the person who shot her. Those are the kind of things we do when we work together. And that is why the Queens Family Justice Center is dedicated to the hard work of making sure that survivors can continue with their lives and live fruitful, happy lives. I wanna thank everybody who I work with. I know I say thank you every day. I know we speak a lot, but I wanna say publicly, Thank you for all the hard work and dedication you put in, and thank you for working with us and for making Queens County better. The next person I wanna introduce is one of those people I work with. Her name is Zuleika Gomez. When you first come into the Queens Family Justice Center, there are people called screeners who uh, speak to you for about 15, 20 minutes, figure out what your needs are, and pass you off to a case manager in, at Works for Safe Horizon. Zuleika started off as a screener, through her hard work and dedication, she became a case manager who are the people who speak with the survivors and determine what help they need and pass them along to other people. And now because of her hard work and dedication as a case manager, she is now a manager in Safe Horizon. And she has a staff of about four or five case managers and she works in the, the criminal court building and she helps, she continues her work as a manager in Safe Horizon. I wanna pass it on to Zuleika Gomez and thank her for the work she does. Thank you, Howard, for that amazing introduction and thank you everyone for having me. I wanna say good morning also to everyone here. 
Um, and thank you all for the amazing work um, that you guys all, you know, help us do and we collaborate on. So um, as Howard mentioned, my name is Zuleika Gomez and I'm a manager with Safe Horizon inside the Queens Criminal Court Program, um, as well as assisting with management inside of the Queens Family Justice Center. I work alongside my colleagues, everyone here, as well as my supervisor, who many of you may know, Ms. Dale Carter, who is the director of Safe Horizon at the Queens Family Justice Center and the Queens Criminal Court Program. So Safe Horizon is the nation's leading victim assistance organization. We have several programs located throughout the five boroughs of New York City. Some of those locations are the courthouses, police precincts, shelters, the FJCs, the Child Advocacy Center, and the community offices, just to name a few. Safe Horizon's priority is the safety of those who seek assistance. When a client first comes, interacts with us, we will assess the need for services. CMs or case managers speak with clients about what made them reach out for help today, and then we prioritize what assistance they're looking for. The case managers or CMs conduct a safety assessment with each client and provide a safety plan for them. No safety plan is the same for each client. They are tailored to the specific needs and situations that they are facing. Especially in intimate partner violence cases, safety plans become the number one priority for us as the opposite party or harming party, as sometimes referred to, is no stranger to the client. They are people who live with, have lived with um, our client, and sometimes they share children in common. There are mutual friends and places, known addresses, and shared family, so safety is key. We also conduct safety plans regarding the desired service. For example, a client may come, come into one of our centers seeking order protection against a harming party. And while conducting our sessions, the client may discover that obtaining an order protection may portray more of a safety threat than not obtaining one. And then we have a conversation about what other options the client may be interested in exploring. We treat all our clients with respect and dignity. They're, this, they're seen as the expert of their lives. So who better than them to make the ultimate decision of what works best for them? We are CMs and advocates and will try our best to assist and advocate on behalf of those seeking services of victims of crime. We partner with many different agencies, as you, as you have already heard, um, and especially those in the FJC to obtain assistance for our clients. Many victims of intimate partner violence may sometimes be victims of other types of crime, and Safe Horizon is also there to help. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a manager with Safe Horizons at the Queens Criminal Court Program, where we see victims of all types of crime. We provide advocacy and referrals similar to the FJCs, with the difference that our referrals are to outside resources rather than in-house, unless we're assisting the victims of intimate partner violence, in which case we refer to the FJC. Um, as Howard had mentioned before, there are times where um, the person who is harassing a victim may be the family members. It may be possible that the client may want to seek an order protection against the family member. So inside of the Queens Criminal Court, we assist clients as well with obtaining orders of protection through family court um, for those victims who are being harassed by others um, if they're family. Um, and again, we see all types of crime victims. So, you know, if it's not something that we may be able to obtain, let's say, in order protection in family court, we can explore other services. Um, but again, safety is key. So we will conduct a safety assessment with each client. Um, I'm not sure if you guys want me to go in more detail about what we do or this type of services we have, or if anybody has any questions, you can feel free. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zuleika. Uh, I, I truly don't think it's possible to say the number of lives that you and the Safe Horizon team have changed or the number of survivors that you've helped. And as Howard said, we truly, truly are grateful for the longstanding partnership that we have with you. Um, so I really appreciate that. I want to just now move on to one of the newer partners at the Family Justice Center, a new partnership that we're also very grateful for. Um, and that's our partnership with New Destiny Housing. So here to speak is Lanny Smith, the housing coordinator of Housing Link with New Destiny Housing, an organization that's committed to breaking the cycle of violence by connecting domestic violence survivors to permanent housing solutions, which we know can be one of the hardest steps. Lanny is an amazing partner at the Family Justice Center who has helped with some of our highest risk survivors, has helped them to relocate 
and find safe housing away from their abusers. Lani, could you please tell us a little bit more about your organization, the work that New Destiny Housing does here at the Family Justice Center? Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, MK. Um, yes, so my name is Lani Smith, and I'm a housing coordinator here with New Destiny Housing. I work out of the family, um, the Queens Family Justice Center, and New Destiny Housing's mission is to end the cycle of violence for low-income families and individuals experiencing homelessness and domestic violence by connecting them to safe and permanent housing and services. To achieve this mission, New Destiny builds and manages housing with on-site services, offers innovative programs that assist survivors in finding and retaining affordable housing, and expands access to permanent housing resources for survivors. So I just want to speak a little bit about um, one client in particular that I did get a referral from. And um, in 2021, this client was actually kidnapped, strangul strangulated, excuse me, and she was in a vehicle chase. Her whole life has been changed. And with the help of ADA Paige Nyer, she is now living the life that she should be living, which is, you know, stress-free. She actually got a new apartment with the help of New Destiny Housing. Um, we were able to find her permanent housing using our housing link assistance. And now she is living in the apartment with her children. Um, if it wasn't for the help of the DA's office and ADA Paige Nyer, she would not be able to do that. So I do thank you guys for allowing us to be here and to continue to partner with you. Thank you, Lani. And on behalf of DA Katz, I do just want to thank all of our partners uh, for the work that they do here at the Family Justice Center. Uh, you truly are remarkable. And there is no way, as DA Katz said, that we could do the work we do without your help. We can't just prosecute our way out of this. Our shared goal, our common purpose, is keeping survivors safe. And here at the DA's office, we know that part of keeping survivors safe is also holding offenders accountable. That's part of breaking the cycle of abuse. And that's why, in addition to the team of partners you just met, we have a team of dedicated, specially trained prosecutors handling these cases. So at this point, I'd like to introduce you to one of the Bureau's leaders, Deputy Bureau Chief Audra Bierman. A graduate of Fordham Law School, Audra has been a career prosecutor focusing on domestic violence in both the Brooklyn and Queens DA's offices for the last 16 years. Audra, could you tell us a little bit about what happens when someone is arrested for domestic violence and some of the ways that we use alternatives to incarceration to stop the cycle of abuse? Thank you so much, Mary-Kate, and thank you, District Attorney Katz, for bringing us together to talk about the work that we do and this important informational session. And as you can see, just like the DA said, we don't do it alone. Um, Mary-Kate mentioned the fact that we, our number one priority is always to keep our survivors safe, and our second priority is to hold defendants accountable for their actions. Very often, abusers will tell the survivor don't call the police. If you call the police, I'm going to jail forever. I'm going to get deported. I won't be able to support you, or you will be deported, or you will lose your children. These are things that just are not true. Jail in um, incarceration for us is only in the most serious, most heinous, most dangerous cases. But 99% of our cases, we look at the threats and we assess them and then we look for alternatives. We speak to survivors about what's going on in the home, whether or not um, alcohol or drugs or mental health are issues. And once we know that information, we can then um, make our offers and our dispositions and, um, and make our informed decisions about what we're gonna do. And there's multiple um, organizations that have programs for uh, abusers that hold them accountable while also getting them the help that they need with an eye towards ending the cycle of violence. One thing about domestic violence that's different than most other crimes is that it is a cycle. It's not a one-time thing and we need to do something to stop it. And the best thing to do is get people the help that they need. 
So once somebody's arrested, within 24 hours, they're going to speak to somebody in our office. Um, the survivor will speak to someone, we'll do a threat assessment, we'll make this, the referral to the services that you just heard about, and we will find out what's going on in the home. This is not an issue that's just about a family. This is a community issue, and I think the DA addressed that. And so there's things that not only do we do here, but that you can do in the community. If you see something, say something. Know what the risk factors are. Know if you hear something, if you hear a neighbor screaming, call the police. If you haven't seen a family member in a while, check in on them. There's so many things that we can do as a community to keep our neighbors, our friends, our families safe and look for those signs. Very recently, we were discussing a situation where there was an animal that was being abused next door to a neighbor. They kept on hearing it and they called the police. And that is so important because as you're going to learn in a few minutes, domestic violence and animal cruelty are so intertwined. And so I'm gonna send this back to Mary Kate so you can hear more about that. Thank you so much, Audra. The interplay between animal abuse and domestic violence that you just referenced is something that I don't think many people are aware of. But DA Katz did recognize that nexus and understood that domestic abuse and animal abuse often occur simultaneously within a family or a relationship. And so that's why she made the Animal Cruelty Unit part of our bureau. And we're grateful for that decision. We're also grateful to the leader of the Animal Cruelty Unit. I don't think there's anyone in the state more qualified to explain the nexus than Nikki Kaferi. Chief of the Animal Cruelty Prosecutions Unit and Deputy Chief of the Domestic Violence Bureau. Nikki has been in ADA since 1992 and works closely with the NYPD's Animal Cruelty Investigation Squad and the ASPCA in investigating and prosecuting crimes against animals. For her work in prosecuting animal cruelty cases, Nikki was awarded the New York City Bar Association Thomas E. Dewey Medal and the ASPCA Award of Excellence. She was also named by the Animal Legal Defense Fund as one of America's top 10 animal defenders. Nikki, could you please explain this connection and the role that animal cruelty of the animal cruelty unit as it pertains to domestic violence? Thank you, Mary Kate. And I am grateful to DA Katz for recognizing the connection between domestic violence and animal cruelty and incorporating uh, this unit into the Domestic Violence Bureau. Um, DA Katz has also expanded the staff to include a new section chief, Lauren Mikowski, and two other domestic violence ADAs, as well as a detective investigator. All of us are specially trained to investigate and prosecute these types of crimes uh, in connection with the NYPD or in association and partnership with the NYPD and the ASPCA. Animal abusers are five times more likely to harm humans. And this is a really important factor to consider. Family violence in particular is susceptible to animal cruelty in the domestic violence, in the child abuse, in the elder abuse situations. Abusers will use a family pet as a very effective tool of power and control to terrorize, control, isolate, silence, punish, retaliate, and in particular, to prevent survivors from leaving their abuser. In fact, studies show that approximately 1 million animals in the United States are abused or killed in domestic violence situations. About 70% of domestic violence survivors report that their abuser has harmed, killed, or threatened to harm or kill an animal, a beloved pet, which is often the only source of comfort and joy in a survivor's life. Unfortunately, many of these incidents, about 75% of the incidents, also occur in the presence of children if there, are pres if there are children present in the household. And this will only serve to perpetuate the cycle of abuse, which is something that we are all aiming to stop and prevent at this point. Um, it is important to know that it is significant in a child's life 
if they are abused, if they are witnessing the abuse of not only uh, a parent or um, it's also a very difficult for them to see a, an animal, a beloved pet of theirs, abused or harmed or threatened to be abused or harmed. And sometimes the domestic violence survivors will report that the children begin uh, abusing animals as well because children do mimic adult behavior. So early intervention for children is really important. But most importantly, the takeaway is, is where animals are at risk, so are humans. And it is something that we need to pay attention to. As a result, I encourage officers, police officers, domestic violence officers, and our domestic violence ADAs to ask about pets in the family, even if an intimate partner or a survivor has not actually reported it because there is a greater risk if an animal has been threatened or hurt in, in the household that the children as well as the intimate partner or spouse will also be hurt. So it, we do encourage anyone, if they know of animal abuse, to report that abuse to the police or to our office. We here have a helpline, which is 286 6622, or you can call myself or Lauren Mikalski or anyone in the Domestic Violence Bureau to report. It is absolutely essential because if that goes unreported, we are going to have further risk for the intimate partners or the family um, involved in a, an abusive situation. The other thing that is important is uh, for survivors, Many survivors report that they are unwilling, more than half of them, to leave a, a, an abusive situation because they fear for the welfare of the family pet. So in planning for an exit strategy, plans must also be made for the pet. For example, you can send a pet to a family member, to a friend, I note that the ASPCA will uh, assist in fostering in a domestic violence situation. Um, I would also uh, like to tout that there is in New York City, the very first pet friendly domestic violence shelter that was developed through the Ur Urban Resource Institute. And I would hope that all of us would encourage more such shelters to um, be developed and uh, so that the people who are wanting to leave can have the opportunity to leave. So we also refer to the Family Justice Center for their wealth of services. Those survivors who have just had an animal um, tortured or hurt or threatened to be hurt so that they too can receive the psychological services that they need, in particular housing services. We have certainly helped to relocate some survivors to different housing so that they can escape the abuse. So in short, I just want to encourage everyone to continue to report animal abuse, even if you think it's not important or it's just an animal. Animals are not only entitled to protection and are protected under the law, but the risk to people is even greater when there is animal abuse involved. Thank you, Mary-Kate. Thank you so much, Nikki. Now, both Audra and Nikki mentioned risk factors in prosecuting domestic violence and animal cruelty cases. And I think it's fair to say that in recent years, we've become much more educated when it comes to recognizing these risk factors. And District Attorney Katz recognizes the importance of training ADAs and of recognizing that education and making sure that we're prosecuting in ways that are informed and effective. So I want to take a moment to discuss some of the innovations and the ways we address domestic violence risk factors under DA CATS. First, DA CATS revamped our beeper program to make sure that an ADA specially trained in domestic violence is available to enhance cases at any time of day or night. So those ADAs who are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, work closely with the NYPD. And one of the successes of this program has been the removal of firearms from homes, which is so important 
because we know that the risk of a domestic violence homicide increases by 500% when a firearm is present in the home. We also know that strangulation is a risk factor for domestic violence homicides. So under DA CATS, we began to partner with the NYPD, the FDNY, New York City Health and Hospitals, and Mount Sinai to join the New York City Strangulation Response Roundtable to develop best practices for responding to intimate partner strangulation cases. We also know that stalking is a risk factor in domestic violence. So we work with the NYPD and the Family Justice Center to ensure that survivors of stalking receive priority services for safety planning. We are in constant collaboration with the NYPD to share information to make sure that the highest risk survivors are kept safe. So I think through this entire webinar, the, uh, the theme has been the collaboration, the recognition that we cannot do this alone. And we know that the work that DA CATS has done to strengthen our partnerships, to increase community outreach, to give us opportunities to speak to people like you has just made such a difference. We feel confident that we are changing abusive behavior through diversionary programs, through education and providing support for survivors. We believe that this work, this collaboration is changing lives. And we want you, the community, to have that confidence. So I want you to know that whether it's in person or virtual, the Queens County Domestic Violence Bureau and our partners at the Family Justice Center are here for you. At the height of the pandemic, I saw these ADAs and these partners work so hard, they never stopped collaborating to keep the Queens community, to keep domestic violence survivors safe. We never stopped working for you, and we promise that we never will. So I want to thank our team. I want to thank everyone who participated in this webinar. I want to thank the community for joining, and I hope that we've given you that confidence to know that what DA Katz has said is true. You are not alone. We are here to help, and no one deserves to suffer in silence. So thank you all so much for joining us in this space. I truly appreciate it.